Ignite, written by Sonia Dogra, based on the artwork of artist Ehlam Abbas. Silence sat gingerly, drinking from a cup of tea, lingering on the kitchen table, frittering its flavour gradually. Routines lay waste, as the wall clock in haste emptied time in a trash of screens, blaming embrace for desires unchaste. Flustered by inflated viruses, I sought colours of lost irises, gathered in a Rubik's Cube, roads outside growing mournful cypresses. Priesting flew by the crested hoopoe, and secretly glistened the morning dew, burning the arts incandescently, the hearth with their warmth imbued. The eyes ached to see those separated by destiny, their parting like a forever lore, pouring verses for affliction's company. I journeyed to the inside, with a polo by my side, striking off what I'm not, to seek who I am tonight. Like a muted fly on the wall, must I have watched the tamasha unroll? Should I have sunk in this palpable tragedy, riding through flakes up to the fall? Just then, unfazed on an orange flower, a wondrous butterfly perched on the bower. My master's strokes the canvas filled, works of Matisse saved the hour. The airbrush and acrylics, a haiku and rhymes. Is art, they asked, even worth a single dime? Well, when ruthlessly the mighty oaks one day fall, a poem silently ignites from within the confines. A poem silently ignites from within the confines. Can you help me find the zipper to this dress I'm wearing, please? If I could find it, I would just unzip, take it off. Leave it behind crumpled on the floor and simply vanish without a trace from this earth. You see, there is nothing here to hold me anymore. I need at least one beautiful lie that I can live by, that I can touch with my hands, taste with my tongue, smell with my nose, gaze at with my eyes to see through this. I am also a beautiful lie, useful for the same purpose. If anyone has a need for it for reasons that match, leave a note under the front door. The mat that said welcome disappeared a while ago and no, I'm not being a drama queen. The last journal entry. And so she let herself into the office with her own set of keys and put up a notice on his board pinned up with fluorescent tacks. It said, Urgent vacancy. A reasonably healthy female of variable physical and mental age urgently requires one beautiful lie to live by that can be touched, tasted, held, smelt and seen. The advertiser is similarly a beautiful lie, useful for the same purpose. Looking for incumbents with more or less matching needs, the job will require some physical travelling and plenty of non-physical journeying alone and together. Backpacker mentality with camping skills and capability to set up and take down pop-up homes, highly desirable. Additionally, keeping and sharing a journal is part of the task list. The attitude to turn water to wine and feed 500 with one loaf of bread and a single fish, combined with a very high pain threshold, are highly appreciated traits. No worries, ample scope for developing and fine-tuning these traits will be made available on the job once selected. For further queries and clarifications, contact the blank page at gmail.com or serve your sentence at gmail.com. Carefully locking the door, she felt the cold, hard shape of the keys 
once more in the palm of her hand, before leaving it quietly on top of the electric meter outside the door. There was no one at the beach when she reached. Her gaze flew to the point of the channel at the end of the stone pier, where she once saw a young boy who had come to have a good time at the beach with his friends disappear into the grey swirling waters. It had seemed so effortless, even innocuous to say the least. She had stood watching then, stock still. Transfixed at the sight of this young boy suddenly go down below the surface, come up again, once only to disappear again. Then all she saw was his outstretched hand. Palm opened once, fingers played, and then he disappeared. Without a trace, as people looked down in disbelief. The minutes ticked past. Nothing happened at all. The water just popped, its cold greyness a swirl, where his hand once was raised like a flag, a last outpost. For a moment, something disturbed her attention and she turned around in the direction of the tug of some invisible line. A fairly well-dressed man with a fleshy face and thick lips was hanging around, slinking behind the remnants of a wall. He stared fixedly at her with expressionless eyes and without pausing once, unhurriedly, he unzipped his fly. Then he began to masturbate, slowly at first, and then with a steadily increasing pace without once taking his eyes off her. She looked back at him fixedly, jaw clenched, without batting an eyelid, feeling a rush of blood briefly go to her head as she did. The brilliant noonday sun briefly was covered with dancing silver spots that slowly subsided. She refused to withdraw her gaze and began to slowly walk backward on the stone pathway that led a hundred odd feet to the turbulent water at the point of the channel where it met the sea. She walked backwards in slow, deliberate steps down the rock pair without once taking her eyes off as he continued his increasingly frenetic movements. The sea, rocking like a cradle, threw splinters of blinding light into the brittle salt air, glinting like mirror shards. Now the man was just a form, about a foot or so tall in her field of vision, a foot high dwarf, making some sort of indistinct, rabidly, unreadably absurd, rhythmic movement. The spot on the grey water, where the water wrinkled, where the hands played outward and sank, swirled just behind her. But now, she had eyes in the back of her head. The sun was so bright that all was nearly white. At that moment, she turned. The grave was cool. So shockingly, deliciously cool. The salt stung her lashes and she smiled. Or did she? The blob of the distant had stopped, bobbing up and down. That was the last thing she saw as she rolled her eyes upwards at the sky, at the noonday sun that spun like a mirrored plate, an oscillating desk. The waters dimpled once where a hand was once raised. The grey lid closed shut, the wake her body left. This poem, Years and Hours, was inspired by Deepa Gopal's artwork, We Are Islands, painting number two. Years and Hours A friend told me once, when a cat purrs, bones heal. In the stories I read as a child, an old woman sat with a cat, her early companion for the night, as she counted her ears. I have now become her. But I count hours and not years, as I sit on a poang chair, sipping tea, and watch through my curtainless window these trees grow into leafless apparitions. Sometimes, all we need is a chair 
to know the shape of our being. Next door, I hear my neighbor's cat purr. Away from love and boredom, she too now awaits, like its owner, that secret art to die alone. My heart stirs, then stills. This poem is inspired by a series of paintings titled Green Fish in the Green Water by Devan Madan Garli. The Hug of the Green As the wind spells spring and evening birds the night, a two-eyed boy with skin, the hue of fertile soil, returns from the toils and expectations of life to sit for a while by the pond in his yard, washing away the day and grime and dives into the realm of possibilities to float for a time. He tastes the emerald water with his big toe as a thought bubbles up on his brow. Do my fingers dare to mirror life on paper and then bring that muse to life? Hands and knees, he is keen to see all there is to see and feel. The curvature of each scale to the depth of each eye, he records them all in his inner eye. And then they flow from his mind, through his fingers, through the colours and onto the paper. Without further ado, the fish he drew draws breath and springs from the paper, home home into the green water. The boy puts forth his request to the fish with folded hands. O oh, green fish in green water, lend me your fins. Flowing as one with the stream, I shall satiate my need to feel the hug of the green. Green fish in green water, lend me your fins. There is a depth to this pond, there is enough for all. The invitation was always open. You can find yourself here, in this green, in this water, immerse, say the fish. He lets himself slide into the water and it curls him. The fish swirl around him in an embrace and welcome him. I stand here statued and still how still is still enough for nature to come to me come in the artist is german fernandez image number three spectral commute in the eerie silence of a viral dawn above streets drained of traffic behind closed doors our windows on the world turn to cages. From station to station, down long lonely lines, empty rail cars transport the ghosts of last year, standing shoulder to shoulder, crowding out possibility. An invitation to absence directs my engagement, wary of strangers, I tend to my business until a train to nowhere comes to carry me home. Remember that fairy tale where a girl must knit coats from stinging nettles for her seven brothers who've been turned into birds? And all that time she mustn't say a word. The old queen thinks she's a witch and demands of the prince who secretly loves her that she be burned at the stake. Though her hands bleed, she's knitting, knitting, even in the cart piled high with wood. Just as they light the fire, the birds fly by. She flings seven coats high in the air. Young men tumble from the sky, except for the youngest brother, who glides one-winged, feathered from the incompleted sleeve. The girl, now her work is done, freely speaks, normal like her brothers. Only one is rich and strange between this world and dreams. So yes, obstacles must be overcome without a word. 
but sometimes magic seems to come from something small that's left undone. Hi everyone, this is Elora. The name of the poem is The Oriole. For years I had kept rummaging, looking for all those trinkets, amassing them over for almost an eternity. All that which glittered and all that which promised to shine, just for that halo, even if not to my mind's eye, but for that of the others, I so yearned for that halo. But alas, for it never did appear. Or even if it did, I didn't seem to cherish its gleam, like those halos of the others. However, sometimes I did ponder if those were also there, just in my mind's eye, or were they really present, like what seemed an era of trysts, only for a speck of that radiance, but to no avail. Exasperated thus, I closed my eyes to all that which was outside. And in all my weariness, finally, today, reached out for that quest within. With the lone hope to dissolve that eternity outside into the infinity inside. And that moment was when I felt a thousand ripples rise in that untouched lake of elixir, which lay there waiting all this while, just for my single touch. And before I could raise my eyes, I felt that enigmatic circle of light in all its purity of glow radiating around my head. And in that split second of divine, I felt the white radiance of that single star in my hand. And now it mattered no more, neither those glittering halos nor the others. Thank you. Tangled is based on a series of sketches by, of the same title by artist Yamini. The fluid yet striking lines and the undeniable earthiness of her art have struck a chord with me, inspiring these words. Tangled, a body on the edge still, cell wary of cell, jaws clenched, mouth closed over words and weary yawns. Memories gathered in grey circles around fading pinpoints of light. A forehead finely etched with the demands of past. Old dreams in a frizzy halo. A torso sagging beneath the weight of lives lived, unlived, almost lived. Limbs falling over themselves, panting, screaming for air. Desires once carefully stored in airtight ceramic jars now congealing at the back of the cows. Fault lines appearing out of nowhere, widening on the landscape of fingertips. A lifetime ago, some tectonic plates shifted, and the body has memory.